Last night, uh, I was at a banquet. Joey Perez. How many of you remember Joey Perez? <laughs> he was a gang leader in Philadelphia back in the 70s. When I was doing street ministry in Philadelphia, he was the biggest drug dealer in Philadelphia for many years. And um, there was a, um, an evangelist that came from Puerto Rico to Philadelphia back in 1979. You realize how long ago that is, 79? And um, there were a lot of people that came. They had it outside in the parking lot area of the school, down on 5th Street in Philadelphia, if you know where that's at. And uh, God spoke to the evangelist that there's a young man there, and he was young back then, a gang leader, that is going to accept Christ. And so Joey Perez listened to the preacher, and God spoke powerfully to Joey Perez. And he accepted the Lord that night, 1979, in summer, 1979. I had been praying for help to do street ministry, especially in Philadelphia and other places, because street evangelism is very difficult in our cities dangerous. I did that for 24 years in Philadelphia. In the worst areas, they call them the badlands in Philadelphia. And I prayed, Lord, send somebody along that has more courage and better preacher than me. Joey Perez got saved in 79, took two years of Bible college in Puerto Rico, he came back in 1981, the summer of 81, and he found out that I was doing street evangelism in Philadelphia by a friend of his. And that was probably one of the biggest blessings of the last 50 years in my life, basically. I had two daughters at home. They were growing up back in the 70s. Actually, late 70s. I mean, they just got born in the late 70s. And so I would come home at night in the summer nights, about 10.30 or 11 o'clock after having meetings in Philadelphia and other places, a lot of other places. In fact, all over these four counties here. I did it with the same mission that I did in, Phil in, in Brazil. Pocket Testament League. And I would come home and I would look at my two little girls sleeping in their little cribs. And what happened was God answered my prayer. God answered my prayer. You notice the, uh, the verses. The verses here t talk about answers to prayer. And um, if we really believe in Jesus, he hears our prayers, and it says the Bible that he answers them. He answers them. And that was just one, one answer that God answered. How many prayers has God answered in your life? Probably a lot, right? A lot over the years. And so we notice in these verses here, anyway, the, the banquet last night was up at the Franconia Mennonite Church, where he usually has a banquet every year. And there were about 140 people who came out. 140 people came out. And that was such a blessing. But it, he had different speakers and music and stuff going on. And I got back a little late. You know, back, and um, when I come down here on Sundays, I like to get to bed early on Saturday night so that I'm really in good shape <laughs> the next morning. And um, so we do practice, you know, our music, and so I have to get here a little bit earlier. 
uh, we get together at 9 30 that's for us over up in the country you know the country area that's that's early so then <clears throat> anyway i I was I always asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to share with these dear people here? This wonderful Korean church. You're, this is a Korean church, right? <laughs> there was a time it was what we call an American speaking church, but that doesn't exist anymore. And so you guys came along and God blessed you with a beautiful church building, right? And and uh, and you had people from uh, how many places this past week here from all over Korea, as well as this this area of uh, Eastern United States or whatever, a a all over America. Wow, that's amazing. So anyway. <clears throat> um, so I, I was praying, you know, I only come, come what, once, once a month now. And um, I pray a lot, Lord, what do you want me to share? Well, you know, we are going through difficult times in America. In my memory, I am 81, you know, just in case you don't know. <laughs> I think you most of them. I have never seen anything what I see happening in America today. When I was growing up in school, I'll just tell you this. Teachers read the Bible first thing before class and had a, they prayed the Lord's Prayer. All over America in all the schools, they don't even mention God. It's illegal anymore almost in our schools. That's how far away we have gotten from our heritage. If you know the history of America, it was it was it started so that people would have religious and freedoms religious freedoms as all other types of freedoms my ancestors came from switzerland 300 years ago and they came here for religious freedom because over in that area where you know in europe many times there wasn't very much religious freedom and so what we're going through now in America is testing time, testing time. I happened to learn something when I was in Brazil that helps me now. Because when I went to Brazil in 1969, in 64, the communists tried to take over Brazil. You know, there's a, in South America has a lot of communism. And they tried to take over the largest country in South America. It's half, a, it's half the land space of South America, Brazil. But the leaders in the, in the, in the uh, country said, no, we don't want this. And they put them in, the leaders of communists in, in, in prison. And I was told when I got there by other missionaries, that if the communists would have taken over Brazil, they were at the top of the list to be martyred, the missionaries. The, there were 4,000 missionaries from America in Brazil when I was there, just in, just in Brazil. And so when I got there to Brazil, I also found out that 60% of the population are spiritists. They worship the devil. They actually call down demons on Saturday nights when they have meetings in different places. And then they put food, they put food out on the pavements to pacify the demons. So I was there for six years, and I found out that they want to hear the gospel more than I ever th realized any people could want. And so we, I was part of four teams, the six years that I was there, four teams, and we realized that every month we would have meetings every night with over a thousand, so that meant there would be four or five thousand every night for a whole month. 
We did it for six years. I did it for six years before I got hepatitis and had to come back to America. And we figured out that about six million Brazilians heard the gospel from these four teams. And all of us were in our 20s, just recently graduated from Bible college or college or whatever. And we, most of us were single at the time. And those were the six best years of my life. We didn't stay in one hotel. They were so hospitable, they wanted us to sit, sleep in their houses. We never ate in a restaurant. We always ate in people's homes. The Christians were so delighted that we were in their community. The Christians that were in some, some places, there were hardly any Christians at all. We traveled all over the country. And guess what? God, I'm looking forward to meeting. I'm hoping that one day when I get to heaven, who knows how soon that's going to be. But I'm hoping to meet a lot of those people that heard the gospel from this, this group of people. But, you know, these verses today... God wants us to be truly committed to standing for truth, for truth. And when you look at these verses, you know, that you read, and uh, we notice here in John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If anyone remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit and this is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So I became a Christian 60, I mean 40, 64 years ago. I became a believer in Jesus Christ. And um, I, I would tell the Lord, Lord, whatever you want me to do with my life, I'm willing. And uh, so as, as I look back and the, the different ministries I was involved in, 61 years ago I started doing different types of ministries. And, and I'm going to do these ministries as long as I live, I, as long as I can walk, as long as I can do things and have health. That's my purpose in life, you see. And so, what did Jesus do? Jesus came, he showed us how to do things, how to live, how to reach out to the poor, how to help those who, who really need him desperately. And the illustration is a Canaanite woman. And here in Matthew, if you, if you want, turn with me to, uh, you're welcome to Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. We notice Jesus went out from them when he was here, you know, in person, and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, Jewish people didn't mix much with the non-Jewish people. And the Canaanites, they didn't mix with at all. And we notice, behold, a woman of Canaan came, where he, he, he went to a place where you can draw water out. And he went into the territory, the area of the Canaanites. He went where Jews weren't supposed to go. But he went there for a purpose because he knew he was going to meet a woman that needed to hear about him. And, um, and so a woman of Canaan, came where he was, they, they both wanted to draw water from the region, and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is demon-possessed severely. Isn't that interesting? My daughter is severely demon-possessed. You know what I had to learn to do when I was in Brazil? When we, came, when we had meetings and we would be out every day uh, for a whole month, and then we would take two weeks off, we were always giving the gospel to other people, telling others about Jesus. 
And every once in a while, we would meet people who were demon-possessed and they wanted to be free of these demons because they knew that the Bible says that Jesus had power and authority over demons. They knew, actually, it's a Catholic country, they say, and, and so they, they had some, some teachings from the Bible, most of the people. And they do one thing, they knew that from learning from other people that Jesus has the power and authority to exercise demons out of people's lives. Take it, demons. And so he said, Jesus, I heard about you. And um, he answered her, not a word. His disciples came and urged him, send her away. For she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said he, uh, he was sent to, first to reach his own people, the Jewish people. And then she came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. He was insulting her. He did it for a purpose and for a reason. He, he always knew how to talk to people. And she said, yes, Lord, even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's hands. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O oh, woman, you notice this was a respectful speaking to her. Now, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. From that very hour. Now, um, I, I don't normally tell this story very often, but I think most of you know that <clears throat> I started a prison ministry back in 1974 when I came home from Brazil. And um, I started going into various prisons, some state prisons, some local county prisons, starting a prison ministry. And um, eventually, we bought a hotel in Schweinsville. And um, when young men got out of prison, we would take them and let them stay at the hotel there in Schweinsville. And so there was a group of us that started going into the prisons as volunteers and giving Bible studies and so forth. Up until this crazy stuff are happening two and a half years ago, we still can't get back into the prisons except down south some places in prisons because of this virus. But for 46 years, I and a lot of others went into the prisons. Back in the 80s, I went into all five prisons of Philadelphia. You know, they used to have five different county prisons in Philadelphia. And for 10 years, I went in there. And, uh, and so we started taking prisoners that came to our Bible studies. And they started, when they got out of prison, they needed to go somewhere and get help, get counsel, get encouraged, get jobs. And so... There was a, a thrift store in, in Schwanksville that was run by two ladies, two women, Christians. It's just a small thrift store. You know what a thrift store is, right? <laughs> People go to buy you know, cheap things and so forth. So they turned the thrift store over to us, and we began to run it to provide jobs for men and then later women coming out of prison. Today, there, we have nine uh, thrift stores all over M Montgomery and Bucks and Lehigh County. Nine thrift stores. 
over 120 employees. Our budget yearly, annually, is over $4 million. And 70% of our graduates never go back to prison if they're alcoholics or drug addicts or, or whatever sin they commit. They never go back to it, and they're completely changed. But some of them have demons. Have demons. And so what I learned in Brazil was how to cast out demons. It's frightened me. It frightened me so much. But guess what happened to Liberty Ministries back in the, uh, about... 24 years ago, we hired a, uh, we always have a, what we call executive director. We hired a young man who was going to seminary in Hatfield, Biblical Theological Seminary. He had been an alcoholic, and he, he started going to seminary because he wanted to get help from God. But what but the, what the board didn't realize was that he was going to, he never became a Christian. And, and if a person doesn't become a Christian, they don't have the Holy Spirit. Follow me? Then demons can come and reside. But demons cannot reside in Christians who have the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. And so this young man... Well, he was young, but he was married and had a couple kids and um, children. And I used to go out to breakfast with him on Fridays because I was one of the founders of Liberty Ministries. And one day I sensed there's something strange in this guy. He was going to se seminary, and, but he was also running our program for young men out of prison. So I sensed that there's something really wrong here. So I invited, I said, uh, well, I would go out to breakfast with him every Friday morning, and then I decided that I was going to ask him if I could pray for him some Friday morning after we had breakfast, come to the office at church I pastored. And uh, he said, sure. So I decided to ask a retired pastor that came to our church, and um, he had experience with demons. He had been to other countries and so forth. And then there was a young lady who was our worship leader, and she had experience with demonic forces. So I knew that they had experience. So I asked them to come and join us after we had breakfast on a Friday morning. And um, so... <laughs> And maybe I shouldn't be telling you this story, but what happened was we gathered around him in my office there at the church where I pastored for 23 years. And um, I put my hand on his head, and he fell down to the floor and started groaning like an animal. It frightened me. But we knew what we had to do. We had to pray in the name of Jesus and call out to Jesus. We did it for a whole hour until we got rid of three demons that were possessing him. When he grew up, his father used to mistreat him and hurt him and beat him in Illinois, somewhere out there that way. He hadn't seen his father in years. And what happened was we went through prayers with, and he became free after an hour of prayer. And then I said, his name is Rick. I said, Rick, now you need Jesus. You need to accept Jesus so that you have the Holy Spirit within you. So we prayed and he accepted Jesus and the Holy Spirit came to live within him. And I, and I said, also, Rick, you're, you're involved in ministry, for goodness sakes. You need the power of the Holy Spirit 
And so we prayed that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. He was planning to, after a year, he was going to quit. He was not going to continue doing that because he couldn't handle it. But he stayed four more years. For five years, he was our executive director. And the board, the board runs this ministry. who have a board, directors. And he took each one of the board members to breakfast to explain to, him, to them what happened to him, how he was changed by God's power. Well, last night, Joey Perez uh, was one of the speakers, and then he had a couple others and so forth. And Joey Perez had a mother and father who were demonic. Today, the mother is a Christian, and his one sister was involved in de de demonic activities. His sister was there last night at the meeting, and she is free from the demonic forces of the past. She was known in Philadelphia as, as, a, as a person who was dangerous. She was known as a drug addict and a drug pusher. And, and these are things that are happening all around us, and we don't realize it until we have to deal with it. You follow me? Well, just in closing, I'd like to look at a couple verses here in Luke chapter 14, if you would. What God is calling us to do, he's calling us to, to be faithful. Um, and we notice here in Luke chapter 14, for example, verses 11 through 13. If you want to turn with me, you're welcome. Luke chapter 14, verses 11 through 13. And what is Jesus saying? He's saying something very, very important, that we're to be humble. We're to be humble. And um, in verse 11, it says, whoever exalts himself will be uh, humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said, uh, to a person, whoever, who invites, invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they invite you back and you have to repay. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because... They cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the, of the just. Well, God is calling us to be involved with people's lives, to help the poor. When, we, when, I, was, when I started the church back in 93 in the Franconia area, which we now have younger pastors running it. In 93, we had a family that attended our church who watched the news. And on the news one night, they showed the homeless in Philadelphia. You know that there's a lot of homeless people in Philadelphia? If you watch the news, if you don't, it's okay. And so there was an 11-year-old boy who attended our church at that time. He's watching the news, and they were showing pictures of the homeless in Philadelphia. They live on the streets, and there's a lot of them. We even have homeless people up in Lansdale, just down from me. And... Um, and so two ladies from our church decided to go down to Philadelphia and, and go to where the homeless hang out, where they, where they sleep and things, where they eat. 
And so we started a homeless ministry back in 93. And to this day, we're still, our church is there is still going and uh, helping the homeless. And, um, <clears throat> well, anyway, about a year ago, you know, <clears throat> my wife passed away nine years ago. And uh, my daughters, my son-in-laws, were trying to encourage me to sell my house and go to a place where seniors live. You, follow, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Senior homes. About a year ago, and then... Um, so I prayed about it, and... Um, I wrote, I wrote on a piece of paper about two weeks ago, 14 big decisions I had to make in my lifetime. <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever sit down and um, write something down, about, like big decisions you had to make in your life? I had 14 big decisions in my lifetime. I wrote them down, and now... The 14th one is about, am I willing to sell my house as my daughters would like me to do? Or do I stay there? Now, every senior citizen in America today, when I was growing up, senior citizens, the kids would keep them in their houses till, till they die. Well, today we put our seniors in institutions. And if our way, we have tons of them. Tons of these places where seniors in their 80s, 60s, or 70s, or 90s live. So I've been visiting them. Of course, I used to visit as a pastor before. But now I have people coming to me and say, you should go there. You can hang out with people in their 90s, 80s, and 70s, and 60s, and so forth. So I prayed for, the la a whole, for a whole year. And so I finally had to tell my daughters and tell a lot of my friends, hey, I'm not going there. I'm going to stay in my house. <laughs> and uh, I had often thought about inviting you guys for a picnic on a Saturday or something. Because I live around, there's woods around me. It's quiet. And... When I was a pastor, when we started a church, we had very little money to invest in building a house or buying a house. So my wife, as you saw in pictures, she was from Brazil. She passed away nine years ago. She said, this isn't right. Most people have their own house. And so there was a group of friends of ours who decided that they were going to build us a house. So a friend of mine who I grew up with, he was in real estate, and I'm going to close with this. <laughs> and um, he said, I'll tell you what, there's a property for sale. It has power lines going over the front part of it, and it's going for $29,000. That was back, back in 84. So he said... It's been on the market for two years, and nobody wants to buy it. It was being sold, a farmer up my way where I live, he, he decided to sell his farm and all his property and put plots out for, to sell. And then he moved to Florida, where he lives now. So this was the last plot of ground that he had, but nobody wanted it because the power lines go over the front part. It's two and a half acres. And so... Uh, he said, we'll offer 15000 I got it for sixteen five. I shouldn't be telling you all these stories. But to me, you're like family. And so, we bought it. Loaned some money and so forth. Bought the property. Then my friend, who's a real estate man, he had friends who were carpenters. They were... They were plumbers and electricians and elect, you know, so forth. So they decided that they would 
invite people, builders and so forth, to come and help Pastor Glenn build a house in their free time. Now, this is unbelievable. We had 29 men show up one Saturday morning, and they, they had dug out, you know, for a basement, and then they put the blocks up on a Saturday. My neighbors were saying, what's going on over there? You know, the Amish have house raisings, you know, that type of thing. If you've never heard of the Amish out in Lancaster. And so, in the beginning of, of uh, it was in 1985 when we decided that we were going to build this house. And it, I had a good friend that I grew up with. He was a carpenter and he has a builder. He built houses as a business. He said, I'll tell you what, Glenn. We'll do whatever other people don't do for you. And so we were able to build this house for $35,000. And over, you know, it didn't take a few years, but we paid that off. And, and I've been, we've been there for 37 years in that house. 37 years. And I told my, another friend of mine, they're all Christians. I hang out with a lot of Christians, you know, have a lot of friends. And uh, I told this one real estate guy, I said, you know, that was God's gift to us. We raised our daughters there at that house. We were, I've been there 37 years. And now you're asking me to go to some home where seniors hang out? I said, God hasn't told me to do that, not yet, anyway. <laughs> but so much, so, so much for that. I had no plan to tell you that story today. And, and if you don't invite me back, it's okay. <laughs> but the fact of it is that God is good. God is good. And I've learned to appreciate you guys so much. It reminds me so much of being in Brazil. A language I don't understand. I learned it quickly in Brazil, Portuguese. But to be around a different culture, that's what has made America great. We have people from all over the world. When, and I'm closing it with this, please. We had one town in Brazil where we were traveling and we went through. Most of them came to America. It was almost empty. This was back when I was there in the 70s. The people just, when I would go someplace to meetings, you know, to live, I mean, to do the, the, the ministry, they would say, how comes you came to a poor country like Brazil when you could be in America? I said, because God called me. Because God wanted me to come and to preach the gospel in Brazil with you guys. But you know, God has plans for each one of us. And I just told you a little bit about my story, how God led me and guided me, and how he, I've seen him do miracles in people's lives over the years. If we worship the God who loves us so much, he said all we have to do is come to him and ask, and he'll try to help us. Father, I thank you today for these dear people here that you would bless them and guide them, and that you would help them as they live committed Christian lives in a day when it's getting to become more and more difficult right here in America. That you would bless this church, that you would continue to use Pastor Lee and his family and others who are involved here. Father, thank you so much for bringing us here together today. Guide us during lunchtime and their meeting this afternoon. Continue to guide this congregation, Lord, especially all the children and all the young ones that you have given them to bring up in their faith. In Jesus' precious name, amen.